and we are going to further examine who we are as a church. What is our identity? What does the Lord have for us? This is Matthew chapter 16. Thank you so much for reading that wonderful verse this morning, young lady. But I'm going to begin in verse 1, if I may. It says here in Matthew chapter 16, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees. Now, normally, who knows? Did the Pharisees and Sadducees get along? No, they did not. But it's interesting how even under the guise of evil, <laughs> Jesus can bring people together. Hmm. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, an interesting word, we'll get back to that, desired Jesus that Jesus would show them a sign from heaven. Now, you got to appreciate, if you go back, you will see that thousands had been fed. Thousands had been healed. They had seen manifestations. Talking about a sign from heaven, when he was born, there was a star in the east, wasn't there? The angels in the heavens heralded his coming to the shepherds. When Jesus was baptized, the spirit in the form of a dove came down upon the Savior, but they want a sign from heaven. And it's very apt that the word tempting is used here. Because basically what they're saying is, and watch the phrasing here, if you be the Son of God, show us a sign from heaven. What does that sound like to you? That is the same temptation that the devil gave Jesus when Jesus was in the wilderness. If thou be the Son of God, wants to bread on temptation. Jesus could have called 10,000 angels. Jesus called in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. So, Provide wonders in the heavens if allowed to. They're talking about show us a sign from heaven, tempting Jesus, not realizing they were speaking to the devil. And that, by the way, is why we as a church cannot be a people who will not have faith. We cannot be a people that only walk by sight. Because the day is coming, we are told, when people will be deceived by virtue of signs and wonders. Now, I need to correct myself. They're speaking to Jesus, but from the devil in this temptation that they are giving Christ. Verse 2, and Jesus answered and said unto them, when it is evening, you say, it'll be fair weather. For the sky is red, and in the morning it'll be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? The Lord is directing them to the word, and very aptly Jesus says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. See, I told you. A wicked people demand a sign and will have no faith. And there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Talking about Jonah. And he left them and departed. If we had time, we'd look at why Jesus talked about Jonah there. And then we jump to verse 13. It says, When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ. The son of the living God, they call this the confession of Peter. We'll get to that. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven, lest you think the truth came from you. It is the Father who revealed secrets. We'll talk about that. And I say unto you, that you are Peter, Petros, Rocky. And upon this rock, 
I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But if you look at the structure here, Jesus asks, who am I? He asks, but who am I? And then finally he says, this is who you are. And that is what we are briefly going to examine this morning. And our message that is titled, Who Am I? Who Am I? Who Are You? Sing this song with me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, pure and holy, tried and true, tried and true. With thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, sanctuary, Lord for you, Lord for you. Ah, and here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Father, I firstly ask that you would hide Ryan, even as you hold him up this morning. Let us not hear from Ryan, let us not see Ryan, but would you, your Lord, of who straight. This is what we ask, dear Lord. Bless and come quickly, Lord, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, let everybody say, Amen, amen and Amen. Well, let's get right into it. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, and here's the first one, who am I? Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, talking about what the rumors were, some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say that you are Elias. Who's Elias? Anybody know? Elijah and others, Jeremiah. Who is that? Or one of the prophets. Let's start with Elijah, because I don't know if you know this or not, but there was a belief in Jewish culture. You can see this in the Talmud, a belief that Elijah would come back. Indeed, I believe it is, who is it that prophesied? Was that Malachi that said Elijah would return, and they're waiting on Elijah. Is this who you are? Some say. What about Jeremiah. There was a rumor that Jeremiah was going to come back. Some say that you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, before we talk about one of the prophets, let's address John the Baptist because in John chapter 1, verses 19 to 23, you will see that they asked John this question. Who are you? Out there preaching and baptizing with fire and all of that. And they asked John, are you the Messiah? And John said, I am not are you Elijah? And John said, I am not. Now, this is interesting because Jesus says that John was the fulfillment of that prophecy. When he said Elijah would come, saying, make way, it was John who would come. But they were asking John, are you literally Elijah? And John said, no. And then they said, art thou that prophet? What prophet? Well, there was another possible rumor in the Jewish community that Moses would return. You've heard that, Pastor Neary? That Moses would come back or some prophet prophesied by Moses. Is that who you are, John? John said, no, I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness saying, get ready for the lamb who is coming. And then John was beheaded, and they say, and Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And John the Baptist is one of the names that comes out. And you have to find it ironic that Elijah demonstrating and even prophesying about the coming of the Messiah. Jeremiah, who talks about the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah talks about the coming of the Messiah. John the Baptist preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah, and they accuse the Messiah of being everything but the Messiah. That's messed up. 
talking about show me a sign. But then Jesus says unto them, but who do you say that I am? This is the second time. First, who do men say that I am? And we like to equate this to the world because believe it or not, men and women are searching for the truth. We cannot fault them for what they do not know. We as a church have a job. And we'll get to that. And then Jesus says directly, who do you say that I am? And then the confession, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And if you read down in the gospels, you will get the implication that this was kind of the first time Peter had said that out loud. You are the Messiah. He professes who God is. And that is our job as the church to profess and proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, to spread the truth, to spread the gospel, to go into all the corners of the world and say, this is Christ, the son of the living God. And how do we do that? Well, we do what I just said. We do it by keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We go to the three angels' message. I don't want to stay there. Fear God, giving glory to him. There is a remnant. There was a church that professes who Christ is by keeping the commandments, by keeping the faith, by telling everybody. And then Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. And this is a little baby warning, I believe, to the church. For all the truth that we have, we did not acquire that truth ourselves. We do not have the truth or the gospel by virtue of anything that we have done, but the Father which is in heaven, Jesus Christ who died for us, lest we start feeling that we are better than anybody else. Amen. Jesus, the second time, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. That's two. And then we get to verse 18. Just a little sermon here. And Jesus says, this is who you are. Who am I? Who am I? Who are you? Now watch this. Say also unto thee that you are Peter, a word that means rocky, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Who are you? He says, you are rocky. Now, we come across a very common misconception right here. People think that when Jesus says, I will build upon this rock, he's talking about Peter. People think that he's talking about Peter when he says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. People think he's talking about Peter when he says you will have the keys to the kingdom. And there are many denominations and there are some religions who falsely give Peter some form of divinity that Peter ain't got. Let's see if we can break this down because we're on the third question. Who am I? Who am I? Who are you? Jesus says, you are Peter, Rocky. Well, let's look at this. Our rock. Look at Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14. Then he shall become a sanctuary, but to both the houses of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over. That text is not talking about Peter. Look at this one. And he is the stone which the and he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone, the foundation. Who's the foundation of the church? 
Well, let's see our foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Christ is the rock. Christ is the foundation. But then it says, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Now, how many, be honest, because I'm one, used to read this text and think that it meant, here's the church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Anybody? Somebody? Thank you. Somebody's being honest. <laughs> yeah. That what it means is the gates of hell will attack the church and will not win. But I want you to look at something right quick. In those days, battle was performed differently than it is now. There are no smart bombs and smart missiles and all that kind of thing right there. So what you would have is you would have a stronghold. You would have the kingdom and they were surrounded by the gates. And then the opponent would approach the kingdom and they would put a siege on the kingdom and they would attack the gates of the kingdom and the people inside the gates would hope that the gates would prevail against the attack. Now, put a pin in that and let's go to Daniel chapter 2. This is where Nebuchadnezzar's dream is. When Nebuchadnezzar saw the statue of gold and silver and bronze and iron and the mixture of iron and clay, and then the rock comes and smites the statue. This is the dream that says God's kingdom will destroy all earthly kingdoms. Look what it says in verse 44. And in the days of these kings, earthly kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed for as much as thou sawest that a stone stay with me church remember who the rock is a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron the brass the clay the silver and the gold the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter now listen Usually, when we think about spiritual warfare, we imagine God's people here trying to withstand the attack of the devil. We're all and why it seems that come and troubles go. Mount the most interesting scriptures because Satan is on the defense. Satan's provoked. He's he's here to break a dick. Well, I need to sit down. And then he says, you are Peter, Rocky. The gates of hell will not stand. And then it says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. And what is the key to the kingdom? Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 6, this is how you get to the kingdom. This is the key to the kingdom. Jesus said unto him, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And in case there was a question, nobody cometh unto the Father but by me. So look at what Jesus is saying here. Who am I? Who am I? Here's who you are, Rocky, but look, the rock is Jesus, the foundation is Jesus, Jesus shall defeat Satan, Jesus is the key to the kingdom, Peter, paradise, this is who you are, you are a church that looks like Jesus. And in naming him Rocky, he wasn't saying he was the rock. He was naming him after himself. How was that? Are we not Christians? Is the name Christ not in there? Who are we? We are a church that's supposed to look like Jesus. Well... Best is time, best, I guess it's time to get to the difficult part. <laughs> Give me some water before I launch into this. Because if we profess to have the truth, listen to me, 
And I believe in the truth. If we profess to have the health message, hey, I'm a vegetarian. If we profess to adorn ourselves in a godly way, but we fail to look like Jesus, what good is any of it? Jesus first. Jesus here. Jesus here. Jesus. You're looking at four generations of Johnsons. Let me give you a little introduction if I could. On your left there is James Big Boy Johnson. See the resemblance in that something? Now, James Big Boy Johnson died when my dad was 17 years old, effectively making him an orphan. His mom died when he was 12. Heartbreaking stories. My dad talking about going to PTA meetings with no P. He was a longshoreman. I've talked about him before. Well, next, there's my father. Many of you know him. That's Robert Dale Johnson Sr. My older brother, who's not up here, he's Robert Dale Johnson Jr. Well, the next fella, you probably know him. That's Ryan Johnson. That was me 10 years ago. I'm city miles, but I know. <laughs> and then next in line is Ryan James Carson Johnson. Now, some years ago, when my father's sister was ill, she, she's passed now, she lives in Wilmington, lived in Wilmington, North Carolina, and, and we are from Charlotte, North Carolina. I, of course, was out here in Las Vegas. My father would drive the four hours. Well, I think it's a little less now. They got a highway going there. My father would drive like the three hours, three and a half hours or so to visit his sister where she was in hospice. And he would come out there and he'd see her. Sometimes she'd know who he was. Sometimes she'd be unconscious. Sometimes he'd go and she'd have those cookies for him that she had stashed. Because they came in to feed. She said, oh, Dale loves these cookies. Now, everybody calls my dad Bob or Robert, but he was known as Dale when he was young. And he went off to school and wanted to be a grown-up, so he changed his name. I want you to know I did the same thing when I went off to Morehouse. I had everybody calling me by my middle name. You know, young folk, we have to stretch our wings, be independent. But she called him Dale, Dale, Dale. One day, my father drives in from Charlotte, gets out of the car, and he's going to visit his sister and an elderly man, and he's there, he's bent at the back, and he has a walker. Walkers don't make you elderly. That's just what he had, you know, and you can see it there, and he's going, and he looks up, and there's my dad. My daddy ain't never seen this man before in his life. And this is what he said to my dad. He said, hey, my dad, man, at that point in his way, he could not wait to tell us that story. That was a good story right there. The sermon yeah, you drive all the way. That's not a bad trip for the kids because the beach when car about that. Kids, if you behave, we will take you to the beach. Yay! But first, let's go visit Aunt Rosa. So there I am. And I go and get out of the car, and I am walking to the entrance of the hospice. And an elderly man, I had never seen this man before in my life. He had a walker. Walker doesn't make you old. I'm just saying that's what he had. And he sees me and says, hey. And I go, yes. Are you Dale's boy? Boy, at the sound of my father's name, I sat up straight. Yes, sir, I am. He said, I can tell by the way you walk. Now, many of you know that I am fond of wearing this shirt. <laughs> Why you got to laugh? I, <laughs> I didn't know I was that well known. Yes, I love this shirt. Some people say it's evil. Pastor shouldn't wear that. 
Oh, don't let that distract you from the message now. I love wearing this shirt. There's a, there's a story behind this, and it has to do with when I was so be crippled with arthritis. And I couldn't do anything. And then when I came out and the Lord restored me, my wife bought me this shirt right here. Praise the name of the Lord. And I'd wear this shirt right here, and I'd wear it. I didn't even pay attention. I'd wear it Pathfinders. You see me wearing this shirt. Oh, there's Pastor Johnson wearing that Superman shirt. One day, I go home. And I see this. That's a little shirt right there, isn't it? Whose shirt is that? I can't fit that shirt. Wife said, that's Carson's shirt. When he saw that shirt right there in the store, he was like, I want a shirt right there like Daddy. I want to be Superman too. And so he has this shirt. And one day, this is true, I'm visiting the school over there at Abundant Life, and, and, and he had this shirt on. And he's walking around, and he's got this shirt on, and he's like, let me tell you who I am. He says, I'm Superman. They're like, okay, good. Wait, wait, wait. Let me tell you why. Because my daddy is Superman. <laughs> See what I'm saying? And wherever he went, he could identify because this is what his daddy wore. And in his mind, people could tell that he was Ryan's son by the way that he dressed. I think you see where I'm going, but I'm going to go there anyhow. That is how we should be as God's church. People look at us and they say, I know whose child you are. I know whose church you are. I can tell by the way that you walk. I can tell by the way that you talk. You don't dress like everybody else. You don't treat people the way everybody else treats you. You don't eat the same way everybody else eats. I see Jesus. It's who you are. And you ought to walk like him. You ought to dress like him. Come on, church. You ought to talk like Jesus. You ought to treat people the way Jesus would treat them. Because if you don't, uh, who are you? If you don't, who are we? If we don't, who are we? man was 91 years old. Just this Christmas, <clears throat> Elder Morris man, when I was growing up, he was a young man. And he'd get you. You go running on the Sabbath, he'd catch you. That is not the way. Don't get caught with your shirt tail out. Elder Morris will get you. He is big on the commandments. And then we grew up. And we went away. And you know how time is, you know? When you're young, summer seems so long. And then you get old, and the years just go. The years have gone by. My family and I were in North Carolina. I had my kids with me. And now Elder Morris is 91 years of age. Praise the Lord. He tells me that he used to pray for me every single day, every single night, constantly when I was ailing because apparently he had a miracle story too. I'd never heard it. The family just recently got to sit down and listen to this man tell his miracle story. And then, and then we sang a Christmas song. Oh, come all ye, you know, and all this. And the Christmas cheer was out and we all hugged, visiting Elder Morris, 91. And then there comes a time, a point when you've said all you're going to say. You've sung all the songs you're going to sing. And soon it's going to be time to go. You know how that is. Well, Elder, I think we're going to go ahead and get on the road. And he hung his head and he said, my wife is asleep in Jesus. My daughter is asleep in Jesus. 
and I don't know if I'm ever going to see you all again on this side of the kingdom. And this man looked at my wife and I. My parents were there. My little snotty brother, Rodney, was there. I've been calling him that his whole life. And he put a shaky finger in the air, and this is what he said. Listen. You should live your life so that people who know you but don't know him will want to know him because they know you. People who have met you but ain't met Jesus, I don't want to meet Jesus because they've met you and if we are not by his grace striving to be like Christ when people see us will they want to meet Jesus will people want to come to the paradise church based on the way you behave on your job in the grocery store when nobody is looking because being like Christ is who we are. You may not have time to give them a track and break down all of the fundamentals, but you can be like Christ. And you will be surprised at how effective just being Christ-like is at converting people by his grace. Well, my foot's wearing out, and it's late. But you never end a sermon without giving somebody an opportunity to make a commitment. Not going to do a long, come on down front sort of appeal. But here we are at the top of the year, in the middle of prayer session. What a fine time to covenant with God, to do our best by his grace, to be like him. If that's what you want, and I'm standing first, because I need it. Will you stand with me? And we can pray together. We just want to be like Jesus. We just want to be a church that is like Jesus. Our rock. Our foundation. The defeater of Satan. Jesus Christ. There are no small commitments. Yeah, we'll mess up because we do. Nevertheless, every stance, every commitment Jesus sees, let us take our commitment as seriously as he does. Yes. And we will continue to pray together. I invite you to come back tonight for our prayer service. Pastor Neary will be leading, and let's continue to be a Christ-like, prayerful church. Our Father in heaven, oh, what a wonderful God you are. But Lord, when we look at you and we look at ourselves, we see, oh, we need Jesus. You are the Christ, the Messiah, and us. Oh, forgive us, Lord. And then fill us with your spirit so that when others see us, they find who we are, a church that wants to be like Jesus. Thank you, dear Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Let everybody say, amen. amen.